the dawn of the space age. The world was racing to the moon. And it looked like America was losing the race. April 12, 1961. A Russian R-7 missile. 20 rocket engines generating a million pounds of thrust hurled cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin around the globe and into history. The Soviet Union hailed the first man in space as a triumph for communism. In these dark days of the Cold War, America's brightest heroes were seven men chosen to meet the challenge of the Russians. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. The pioneers of Project Mercury. Wally Shira, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Deke Slayton, Gordon Cooper, and Virgil I. Grissom, Gus. While most of the astronauts enjoyed the public attention, Grissom always seemed uneasy in the spotlight. Well, there was never any question in my mind about volunteering. Uh, it was just, uh, could I uh, get in on the program? Behind his reserved facade, Gus Grissom was among the most competitive of a hard-driving crew. Gus was a go-getter. He didn't talk a lot, but when he did talk, it was worth listening to. And although we were all cut from the same cloth, he had his uh, strengths that were uh, unequaled by any of the other guys. Over 2,000 hours flying jet aircraft, 100 combat missions in Korea, a degree in mechanical engineering, when opportunity knocked, Gus jumped at the chance to add rockets to his resume. My father loved. He thought that this was just one of the greatest things that ever happened. My mother, of course, uh, didn't understand this at all. And back at, in 1959, when they were selected, people thought this idea of going into space was just ludicrous. Before launching a man on a rocket, NASA had serious challenges to overcome. I recall very well being at the Cape prior to any of our flights and watching this rocket take off and blow up. And my, are we really going to fly on one of those things? But by spring of 1961, NASA's single-engine Redstone rocket was certified for manned flight. This Redstone missile is the center of world attention as Commander Alan B. Shepard, Jr. watches some final preparations. The first man to test the booster was Navy pilot Alan Shepard. Barely three weeks after Yuri Gagarin's flight. 9.34 a.m., May 5th, 1961. Alan Shepard's 15-minute ballistic journey, a 300-mile arc through space to the Atlantic, was a small step compared to the Russians' orbital flight. But it triggered an explosion of national pride, from the White House to Main Street. America was back in the space race and eager to catch up. Next to carry the torch would be Air Force pilot Gus Grissom. His mission, the final test of a new, improved Mercury capsule. With his engineering background, Gus had been the astronaut's voice throughout development of the cockpit. Like each of the Mercury 7, he tagged his capsule with a number 7 and a nickname, Liberty Bell. 
He even added a painted-on crack. Gus spearheaded the test pilot's campaign for a joystick for manual control. In his capsule featured the first picture window for a panoramic view. But Liberty Bell's most important innovation was a new emergency exit, an explosive safety hatch that could be blown open at the push of a button. a.m. July 21st, 1961. Cape Canaveral, Launch Complex 5. Captain Gus Grissom prepared to test the improved Mercury capsule with his life. Oh, uh, I think everyone has a certain amount of fear of uh, things that are unknown, and uh, uh, I certainly do, but I'm used to this sort of thing, so I accept it. I will be scared and uh, let it go at that. On top of the redstone gantry, 59 feet above the concrete blast pad, Grissom squeezed into his ship with the help of his backup, John Glenn, and the pad crew led by Gunter Vent. The Mercury spacecraft was very, very compact, you might call it. Uh, he obviously kid it and says, okay, you get in with a shoehorn and you come out with a can opener. For only the third time in history, a man prepared to ride a rocket into space. You don't put a man on the end of a rocket in 1961 and not be nervous, because if you weren't nervous, you didn't know what the hell the story was all about. I wouldn't say he was afraid, but if he wasn't somewhat afraid, again, he didn't understand the problem, and Gus understood the problem. 3.58 a.m., all systems go. Three hours to final countdown. The Ocean Explorer sonar is approaching the bottom, 15,000 feet down. Inside the sonar van, the search goes on 24 hours a day. Packed with sensitive electronics, the van is headquarters for the mission's brain trust. Kurt Newport, Richard Daly, Steve Wright, and Mark Wilson. Well, unfortunate, there's a, a lot more feature to the bottom than yeah. we uh, originally had uh, anticipated. Yeah. Gives us the possibility of missing it, you know, if the target landed in uh, one of these ravines, it would be hard to detect. Like any sonar, the side-scanning Ocean Explorer sees with sound. With each pass, acoustic signals sweep the ocean floor over 500 yards to either side. But a blind spot more than 300 feet wide runs right down the middle. Enough room to hide a fleet of space capsules. A computer converts the underwater echoes into the sonar display. Mud and sand read in shades of gray. Harder, more reflective targets show up as bright blips or black shadows. Standing upright or laying on its side, you'll see an actual shadow behind it, just like we're looking yeah. at with the sand waves. Yeah. So you can measure the width, the length, and the height of the shadow, and then uh, the program will come back and tell you exactly how big that object is. Each pass through the target area takes eight hours. And trailing over 20,000 feet of cable adds even more time, over six hours, just to turn the boat around. Even working around the clock, the team can do no more than two search lines a day. 